word of God from Matthew um, 16, verses 13 to 20, which is page 950 in the Pew Bibles. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Thank you so much. We've called the message today, Turning Point, the Turning Point. We've all had various turning points in our lives. As we look back uh, over our lives, there's been crossroads and turning points. It may have been uh, over the decision you made to pursue a certain career, and it, it affected the whole trajectory of your life as you moved into your particular profession or calling. The turning point may have been when you married the love of your life and uh, how you got to know another family and became integrated into that family and how it changed the whole trajectory uh, of your life. It may have been when you made a choice to move far away from your home, far away from your family, and start your own life in another place, and how it changed the trajectory of your life. Like some of us, you may have moved continent, moved country, and uh, so much has changed. Ultimately, it may have been when you became a Christian, and you surrendered your life to Christ, living under his lordship. And as you look back, what a change there's been in your life. There's been a turning point for you. Our passage today will show us a dramatic turning point uh, in the book of Matthew. From here on out, things change. Up to here, up to 16 chapters, Jesus has been involved in teaching and preparing his disciples. Now at this critical juncture, Peter comes to make this great declaration about Jesus, and the focus of Jesus' ministry changes. No longer is he preparing his disciples, now he starts to focus on the cross and his enormous sacrifice for us. So in this book, there's a turning point. For Peter, there was a turning point too, as he came to understand who Christ was. So we come then to look at this, the turning point, and examine the turning points in our own life. First thing I want to point out to you is the setting that we are given. The setting that we are given. Now your Bible is open there, I trust, or some device that you're using, and you see there at verse 13 and 14, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So now we see the setting. And please understand, this is not just a travel log. The writer of the Bible isn't saying, he went here, and then he went there, and then he went there. It's not just a little travel log. The stage is being set. You know, when you go to a, a performance and something's going to dramatically change, they change the backdrop. So our writer is showing us here that the backdrop has changed. Jesus has moved away from the Galilee. He's gone up the valley, about 35 kilometers, about a day or two days journey, and he's gone to this area called Caesarea Philippi. Now, there are two Caesareas in the Bible. There's the Caesarea on the coast, beautiful uh, area. Um, I've been there, I've seen it. It's a lovely seaside um, area, and it was developed by Caesar there. This Caesarea Philippi is inland. It's, it's in a beautiful valley, 
and it's very tranquil. When Jesus ministered on the Sea of Galilee, it was hot and humid. But here, if you go to Caesarea Philippi, it's cool, it's refreshing, it's much, much higher, lovely lush valley, and in fact, it's also the start of the, the River Jordan. It's a beautiful area, but sadly, it was also a place of incredible decadence with um, uh, with, uh, with idols and godlessness. In fact, the area was also called Pania, and it uh, spoke about the birth of a Greek god, Pan. In fact, you know something of that god. It's that god that sometimes appears that you see in pictures, half goat, half man. And he plays little pipes called the, the Pan Pipes. And so this um, evil god uh, was said to have been birthed there. Like so many of the Greek gods, there was all kinds of sexual immorality connected with him uh, and so on. And he was worshipped in that area. But not only him, there were many uh, other gods worshipped uh, in that area. Lots of, of different statues. Um, in fact, also there was a... a um, a big temple to Caesar there, thus Caesarea Philippi. Caesar's statue was there, and part of worship was there as well. It was a place of satanic worship. It was an evil place. In fact, I've been there. Uh, I've been there with some of you who came with me to the Holy Land. And as you see there, uh, as you see there, there's a cliff, and worked into the cliff, there's these little um, alcoves, and in each alcove there were... Um, statues to other gods. And you see that big hole that's there? That's the start of the Jordan River. And there was, there's a footprint there of a temple that was built there. In fact, there's 14 footprints of temples in the area. But that particular one is particularly interesting because that place is called the Gates of Hell. You see, in that temple, human sacrifices were thrown into that grotto and they were, were given to foreign gods. So it was an evil place. Now you say, why, why do you take us there? It's, it's as it were, Jesus stands there with this pantheon of other gods around, and as it were, he sweeps his hand and says, of all of these gods, who do you say I am? So in this, this junkyard of gods, with all this comparison, he says, who do you say I am? And they answer with a little measure of confusion. Some say Elijah, and they weren't too far off because remember where Jesus had just come from? From feeding people in the desert when he preached to them. Didn't Elijah preach in the desert? So they weren't so wrong in saying Elijah or Jeremiah. Remember when Jesus saw Jerusalem? Before the crucifixion, he wept over Jerusalem, and Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, so they weren't so wrong there. Others say John the Baptist, and you can understand why they called him John the Baptist, because John the Baptist was a fiery, fearless prophet who, who called people by name, and he often attacked the Pharisees. So Jesus could have been mistaken as John the Baptist or just yet another prophet. Obviously, there was confusion. And if you were to step out today from this church and walk onto the streets of Auckland and ask people, who do you say Jesus is? I wonder what kind of answers you'd get. It would be so wide and so varied. Sadly, sadly, I've got to say, that's true in some churches. There's a misunderstanding. They've invented a Jesus of their own making. They've invented their own, own golden calf. He's kind, he's gentle, he's loving, he's inclusive, and he's never angry, and he never judges. They've made a Jesus of their own making. They're confused about Christ. I trust we're not. In this church, you'll hear that Christ is the son of the living God that he's the divine creator and sustainer of all things, that he's the all-sufficient and only savior, the great high priest, the master, the healer, the one in heaven, the truth, the life, the way. As the Bible says, the son is the image of the invisible God. And as Hebrews 1 and verse 3 says, and I love this verse best, the son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, 
sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he provided purification for all men, he sat down in the place of authority. A lovely definition of Jesus. So we ask ourselves, who is Jesus? In the pantheon of ideas of Jesus in our world today, who do we say he is? Well, we come secondly then, we've seen the setting. We see, uh, and that's again that, that picture of the grotto um, where human sacrifices were thrown and called the gates of hell. Sue actually took that photo. We stood right there and took that photo. And then the second thing we come to as our passage unravels there in verse 15 and 16, Peter begins to answer, but what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answers, here it comes, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now Jesus makes it personally, he says, who do you say? And the Greek has the idea of not just Peter, but all the disciples. Who do you as a collective group say I am? And maybe that question comes to us today here in this church. Have we made up our minds of Christ? If he is Christ, if he is God, if he is the only Savior, we ought to have responded to him. For the Savior, the Savior will one day be the judge. So we need to respond aright to him. Who do you say I am? It's not enough. It's not enough to say he's a great teacher, the greatest teacher. It's not enough to say he was a great man and a great prophet and a miracle worker. It's not enough to even say he's from God. Because do you know, the devil say that? Even the demons believe. Remember when Jesus was casting out the demons, they would say, what do you want with us, Christ, son of the most high? Have you... Have you come to cast us out before the appointed time? The demons, my friend, have better theology than some ministers because they believe Christ is the Son of God and the judge of end time. Oh, my dear friend, we must come to clearly understand who he is. And here Peter comes, and in my notes I've underlined it in purple. When I underline something in purple, it's shouted out because this is the greatest statement Peter ever made. This is his aha moment. Now understand, this isn't a moment he came to in a point in time. This was a moment that grew in his life. When, Christ, when Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, this is after two and a half years of being with the most remarkable man who ever graced the earth. This is after seeing every miracle. This is after hearing all his phenomenal teaching. This is after him, he stilled the storm. This is after him feeding the 5,000 and then the 4,000. This is after he cast out the demons. This is after Peter realized he's fulfilling every single prophecy to the nth degree. When Peter assessed all this, he did an audit and said, you are the Christ, the evidence is before me. Note how the statement reads. In the original, it's, it's very sort of staccato. It, it reads like this. The Christ, the Son, the God, the living one. That's how it reads in the original. The Christ, the Son, the God, the living one. It's the definite article four times over, sort of to underscore in purple what Peter is saying. You just think of those words. He called him the Christ. The Christ. Christ is not his surname. Like my name is Ben Dykeman. Ben's my first name. Dykeman is my family name. So Jesus Christ, Christ is not his family name. Christ means he is the anointed one, the promised one. The one that Isaiah spoke about. Remember those um, Christmas prophecies? For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and so on. Those prophecies point towards him being the Anointed One, the one who is coming from far off and has now come. It also says he's the Son of God. And forgive me for underlying it again, because I've mentioned it to you before. When the Bible says son of God, it doesn't mean he's less than. 
Here you've got the Father and then the Son. No, no, no. In Bible talk, the idea of the Son of God is that which is equal to God. In fact, when the Pharisees asked him who he was and he said he's the Son of God, the Pharisees said, you have made yourself... That's right. You have made yourself equal with God. The Pharisees understood to be the Son is to be equal. So Peter's declaration, you're not only the promised Messiah, but you're the one equal with God. And then this is the part I like best, the living God. In contrast to this pantheon of stone and wooden gods all around us that are dead and cold and lifeless, you're the living God. You're different to them. And oh, I love what Jesus says to Peter. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Peter, you are blessed. God has blessed you because you've come to this understanding. And my dear friends, those of us, and I know there are many of us in this church, who have come to that understanding, have come not on our own journey, but because of God's gracious, merciful hand upon us. He's opened our understanding. He's touched our hearts. And he's, he's made us to understand the wonder of Christ. And we too are blessed. We too are blessed. As you go into this day, and as you spend some time in this day, just remember, God in sovereign grace blessed you by giving you the understanding who Christ is. So many out there haven't been touched. For some reason, unbeknown to me, God once touched my life. And at 17, I surrendered my life to Christ. And you, many of you have done the same. And we are blessed of God. Blessed are you, Simon, because God has revealed this to you. And then thirdly, now we get to the... Um, the thinking part and the harder part, I'm going to have to ask you to concentrate now. You might have been gliding and surfing and thinking of Sunday lunch. Now you've got to stop because these next two points will need a bit of attention. And the reason why is because there's all kinds of confusion that has been spun as a web around these truths. And I want to unravel that confusion. So we come there to the promise. You see there in verse 18, it says, And I tell you, so this is Jesus speaking to Peter, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. For once, for once, Peter got it right. For once, Jesus didn't have to turn around to Peter and rebuke him or correct him and say, oh, how dull you are and how slow you are to learn. For once, he's got it right. Peter is the disciple, they say, with a foot-shaped mouth. Do you know people with a foot-shaped mouth? They just seem to put their foot in it and get it wrong. Peter was that way. But this time, he got it right. So what is Jesus saying to Peter when he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Well, let me tell you what it's not saying. Are you listening? What it's not saying is this. You are Peter, and because you've made this great statement, I am going to make you the foundation of the church, the pope of the church. And you will pass on this popery to the next pope, and to the next pope, and to the next pope, and the church will be built on you. Because you've made this great statement, you are the rock on which I build my church. That's what he's not saying, but that's what's interpreted today. The words of Scripture we must pay attention to. What he's saying is this. You are Petros, a pebble, a small stone. Sometimes when you hark, you get a pebble in your boot and it becomes irritating. You are a pebble, Petros, and on this Petra, this huge rock, I will build my church. What's he talking about? What's this huge rock? What's this foundation? The foundation is this. Christ is the son of the living God, the Redeemer. On this rock, I will build my church. You are Peter, the small stone that has made a great statement. And on this great statement, I will build my church. You see, my dear friends, please listen. The church is not built on a man. 
The church is not built on a disciple. The church is not built on a follower. The church is built on Christ. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And you say, did Peter get that? He did. Peter understood that. The established church may have twisted it, but Peter understood it. Note, when Peter wrote his, his letter in 1 Peter, Peter says this, As you come to Christ, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, offering spiritual sacrifices to God. For Scripture says, See, I lay in Zion a chosen and a precious cornerstone, great stone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Peter understood there is a rock that either crushes you or gives you foundation, and that rock is Christ. In fact, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, listen to what he said. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, who God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you. Note these words. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected and has become the capstone or the cornerstone. So Peter understood that what Christ was saying is he's not building his church on Peter. In fact, if you read this chapter and you go a little bit further down, as we'll see next week, Jesus starts to talk of the cross and going to Calvary. So you know what Peter says? As long as, I, as, long as I'm in charge around here, you're not going to the cross. No one's going to crucify you as long as I'm in charge. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Was God going to build his church on a man like Peter, who just a few sentences later he called Satan? Of course not. The church is built on Christ. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. And then he gives the promise. He says, because my church is going to be built on this great truth that Christ is the Son of the living God, the Redeemer and the Savior, even hell, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. All of hell, all of Satan's ways will not prevail. Oh, there will be powers and authorities and kingdoms and governments and emperors and presidents and, and all the rest will oppose the gospel, but they will not win. The church wins in the end. You know how I know? It's in my Bible. The last book of the Bible tells me the church wins in the end. It was just recently that we had a prayer meeting with our, um, our missionaries and one of our missionaries who's a part of the evangelism explosion, a, a, a ministry that started in a Presbyterian church in the United States and now has spread that ministry around the world. They reported that last year, a COVID year, 14 million people surrendered their lives to Christ. 14 million in their ministry claim Christ as their own. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then lastly, I want to just close by um, the um, responsibility given. You'll see that as the passage goes on, uh, the Lord says something else that is even more confusing. Have I lost you this morning? You, okay. The Lord says something else that is even more confusing, that is, is polluted today, but I want to try and unravel. I ask you to concentrate. I hope you're with me still. Verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, some who get it wrong understand this, it, this way. So this is not what it means. It doesn't mean that Jesus now turns to Peter and says, because you made this great statement, and because I'm going to build my church on you, I'm going to entrust to you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Those you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Those you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Peter, as the authority in the church, I'm going to allow you through the church to either open the doors of heaven or close the doors. That's not what the passage means. And that has been taught by certain groups over the years. What does Jesus mean when he says that? Well, may I underscore that no man has the keys of heaven, no church has the keys of heaven, no denomination has the keys of heaven, no pope, no priest, no bishop, no minister. There is only one who has the keys of heaven. And that is Christ himself who's given us the gospel. Didn't Jesus stand before the disciples in John 14 and say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And didn't Peter preach in chapter 4 and verse 12 of Acts, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which you must be saved. And Dr. Luke says, I tell you the truth, that unless you repent, you too will perish. So what is the way to heaven? Through Christ and repentance. The key is the gospel of Christ. The key is the message of Christ. The key is the good news of Christ. The key is Christ himself. The key to heaven is not vested in a church, but it's vested in the gospel. And we carry that gospel. There's the rub. There's the main point. Jesus is the key to heaven. And that message of Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone, is entrusted to you and me. It's not the church that has the key, it's us that have the key. For if we share Christ with our neighbor or our relative or our child, and that child or neighbor or relative is saved, have we not opened the door of heaven to them? And if we keep the key to ourselves, if we bury the key, are we not bearing the opportunity of the gospel? And may I just also say that some people use this passage with regard to prayer. That which you bind on earth you will be bound in heaven. Prayer has nothing to do with this passage. It's all awash with the gospel of Christ, that Christ is the means. For salvation is found in no one else. And then Jesus says, but you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If heaven's door is going to be opened, it'll be opened because we carry the gospel to others. It was just the other day that I went for a walk in the park. I really enjoy walking in Cornwall Park. One of the blessings of the manse is that it's so close to Cornwall Park. I went walking. I locked the door. I put the key in my pocket and off I walked. I didn't realize my son-in-law who were coming home from work couldn't get in. The door was locked. The key was in my pocket. It's the same with heaven, isn't it? He's entrusted us with the key. Well, we... Use that key, share it with others that they might enter heaven. Or will we put the key deep in our pocket, bury it deep and not share it with another? Well, we've looked at many things this morning. And we've come to see that the turning point for Peter, after two and a half years, he found that Christ was the son of the living God. I trust and pray that that's been a turning point in your life. And then secondly, we saw that Peter's blessed. Blessed are you, Peter, for no man has revealed this to you, but God has. And I pray that as you go away, you would say, Lord, I am blessed that you have touched me with grace and opened my heart. We've opened our heart to Christ, who is our rock. And in a day like this, to have a solid rock like Christ, immovable, is wonderful. And so God has also placed in our hand the key. Will we bury it deep somewhere, failing to share it with others? Or will we use the key of the gospel to open the door for others to enter heaven? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we've looked at what can be a difficult passage. We've looked at a passage that is so twisted and contorted today that the true meaning has been lost. We pray that as we've tried to work our way, though faultingly, 
through the passage that a deeper clarity would have come for all of us. Lord, we want to thank you that in a day of change, in a day of uncertainty, that we are built on the rock who is Christ. And we want to thank you, Lord, that the gates of hell and any country's philosophy will not stand against the gospel, but that it will triumph and we're on the victory side. The Lord, the grave responsibility which weighs down heavily on our souls is that you've entrusted us with the message of the gospel. Oh Lord, deliver us from bearing it deep. Help us to use that key. Christ is our hope. Help us to share that gladly with others at every opportunity. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.